afternoon or in the evening. Um, so good evening to you. Welcome to uh, our webinar today, which is uh, titled Leveraging on uh, Emotional Intelligence for Workplace Performance. Thank you for being with us uh, this particular evening. Um, we had quite a bit of people registered to join this webinar, so I'm just going to ask as you log in, you just let us uh, give us about one or two minutes um, as we wait for a few others to join in so that we can get to a, a quorum number. But as we wait, I encourage you, please uh, let me know where you're joining us from, which town you're joining us from, and then give us uh, tell us about the weather there. Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it raining? And then as you share on the chat, uh, I will lead, I will comment on um, and, and let everyone know who it is that is here with us and where you're joining us from. My name is Vicky Karuga and I will be your uh, moderator this evening during this particular webinar. So put it in the chat, let us know where you're joining us from and uh, what is the weather there like? Um, can see quite a few people are coming in now. I am Vicky Karuga. I am joining you from Nairobi and no, from Naivasha actually. And here it is very cold at this particular moment. It's, it's I must say it's, it's quite cold. And I'm looking forward to seeing where everyone else is joining us from. I know we have a team in Nairobi. I don't know whether Nairobi is raining now or it's a bit better. I'm still waiting for your messages. Let me know where you're joining us from. There's a great, I see there's a Manuela Hina, and she's joining us from Nairobi. And the weather in Nairobi is cool and dry. Uh, and this is Akini Laureate. I am unable to hear you. Um, perhaps you can you need to log into to audio. Um, Joan Kimire, good to see you again, joining us from Dar es Salaam. Uh, and she says it's hot and humid. Thank you very much. Uh, it is the headphone icon. I'm trying to help someone out. I have Liz from Current View. She says it's very cold. I have Douglas uh, Lutome who says he's joining us from Kakameka. The weather is a bit cold and gloomy. Uh, I have Grace from Nairobi. Um, I have uh, Linda joining Marue from Nairobi and says wherever she is, it's quite cold. We have Lydia and Jerry joining us from Ruiro. We have uh, Pam Bateta who's joining us from Nairobi. We have Irene Winde. How are you this evening, Irene? Joining from Nairobi where the evening is cloud and chilly. And then we have, uh, we have, we have Wamoyo Kambo from Sokimau Machakos. The weather is cool. Um, we have engineer Iham Ali in Arusha. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. She said, he says it's very cold. And then we have Joan from Nairobi, Joan, a team from Nairobi. So thank you all for joining us um, this evening. Um, I think we are about ready to start the session, uh, about five minutes past, uh, past the six. And the topic today um, that we are tackling is really leveraging on emotional intelligence for workplace performance. Um, if you are new to Profiles International, we are an organization that delivers psychometric assessments, training and development, and also digital learning. And if you want more information about us, you can follow us on LinkedIn as Profiles International or on Facebook or on Instagram. You can also write to us and uh, there's a gentleman called Marvin who's at the back end. Who will be, he will be putting the details on the chat right now on how you can get more information about us. And we run these webinars both for, um, we're also in, con in partnership with um, the, the Impact Learning Academy, which is based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And we actually must apologize that uh, we were meant to have this webinar with uh, our key partner, uh, Mama Zuhura Muro, but she couldn't make it as she has traveled. And wherever she was, she's not able to be here today. She was uh, another core moderator of this particular conversation. So in Mombasa, I mean, in Dar es Salaam, we, uh, we are partners with Impact Learning Academy. 
And uh, they also offer psychometric assessments. They're in the area of learning and development and human resource consultancy. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest for today's session. Uh, and uh, she is uh, no stranger to, I believe, most of us here, having worked uh, for about 21 years in this area of human resource. Her name is Dr. Susan Murage, and she is a consultant in organization development and strategic human resource management. She has extensive experience in the private, the public, and the development sectors, during which she has been a team leader in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. Her key areas of specialization are organization restructuring, that is designing, redesigning the structure for strategy alignment, change and culture management, organization capacity assessment, human resources audits, performance management, training needs and competency assessment, and coaching for results, and then building cohesive teams for improved productivity. So we have someone here who can really talk to us about all matters, her organization, and should you want to reach out to her later on, We'll give you her. We'll give you her her credentials. Um, her strengths are in working collaboratively with clients to set meaningful performance objectives aligned to the strategic direction of the organization, developing tools and processes for tracking performance objectives, and embedding competency based coaching and development programs. She is a certified pro site change management practitioner and a certified clarity for you practitioner providing corporate learning and coaching solutions using the Clarity 4D model. She is also a certified productivity, and that is our topic for today, and generous emotional intelligence coach and facilitator for the generous emotional intelligence leader. Her academic credentials include Doctor of Business Administration degree in Leadership and Change from the United States University, International University here in Africa. And she has a master's degree in business administration with a specialization towards strategic management. And her first degree was actually a Bachelor of Commerce. I did not know this. I don't know why I thought it was human resource. <laughs> but she has a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Nairobi. She holds a practicing certificate from uh, IHRM, which is an organization here in Kenya that is tasked with ensuring that the professionals in the human resource space are um, you know, up to par and operating uh, as real professionals. So. We are in good hands when it comes to this discussion with Dr. Susan Murage. So without further ado, I'd like us to welcome Dr. Susan Murage to this conversation. Perhaps we can use that emoji. There's an emoji here for clapping hands as she comes in, or we can put in a, a, a love heart or a thumbs up, whatever it is. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Murage. We're very welcome. We're very happy to have you today. Uh, thank you, Vicky, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone who has been able to join us today on this very inter interesting topic of leveraging emotional intelligence for workplace performance. And I want to start with a question. I don't know what motivated you to sign up for the webinar. I, I just want to hear from one or two people. You can put it in the chat. What was your drive? What was your motivation? Uh, so that when we start engaging, because I'll just have a short session, and then we can have a QA. and a I don't want to take more than 15 to 20 minutes, and then we can have an engaging session. So you can just put your motivations on the chat, then our team will um, consolidate them and see how we can engage on some of those later, just post on the chat. So regarding emotional intelligence, I also want to start with an, uh, to use another question. If you went for an interview session and you were asked a question uh, to tell the interview panel how in your work life you've been able to demonstrate emotional intelligence, what are some of the insights you will share with the panel that will convince them that you are actually able to use this as a competence? And in HR right now, we are focusing more on competency-based interviews, competency-based development, so when we talk about a topic, of course, we want to also see it demonstrated. So my discussion and our discussion points will be around how do you really demonstrate emotional intelligence to drive performance and productivity in the workplace? Now, let me start with how we define as genos, the model we use in emotional intelligence assessment, 
is called the genus model. And it defines emotional intelligence as a set of skills that helps you perceive, understand, express, reason, and manage emotions within yourselves and others. For what? To enhance how you make decisions, to enhance how you behave so that you drive performance and productivity. And I always say that um, emotional intelligence, once you master it, it's like the key to self-mastery. Uh, and self-mastery is one of those competencies helps you drive productivity in the workplace. And um, within the same model of Genos, the we talk about three things that once you are aware of how what you, how you behave makes people feel and how that impacts on the decisions you make, how people end up behaving in the workplace, you will see that there are certain things that actually come out and start driving organizational cultures. For example, when I, I, I ask uh, about your organizations and the values that we so much put on the walls, they are so clear, teamwork, integrity, professionalism, if we were able to translate those values into specific behaviors in the workplace and check how actually those behaviors drive productivity, it's the same way emotional intelligence does. Once you are aware of that competence and how it is demonstrated and uh, the behaviors that you're supposed to demonstrate so that it drives the productivity and the performance, now you will be mastering how emotional intelligence manifests as a competence. And the research has demonstrated that how there's a very direct link between the way people feel and how people perform at work. When you look at this chart, you will see that um, there's a blue line and a red line. The red line speaks of high performance workplaces and the, blue li the red line speaks of low performance workplaces. So re research demonstrated that um, when you have when people feel proud, the blue lines, valued, anxious, sorry, proud, valued, optimistic, cheerful, uh, those are the only positive ones that are in the blue line. It demonstrates that it helps people drive higher productivity in the workplace. Yet when people feel worried, the red line, depressed, inadequate, cheerful, uh, anxious, it has also a direct link to how uh, performance uh, is related. There is low performance organization. So why are we driving the conversation around emotional intelligence? It's because once we understand how we behave and how our behavior impacts our colleagues, impacts the people we work with, our clients, our customers, our even in families, our, our siblings, our children, there is a direct link to what's, how those emotions make people perform or how they end up engaging with us the way we want. Uh, now, within the wider research pool, the World Economic Forum has also done research and it has demonstrated that among the top skills that are really sought after in the marketplace right now, it's emotional intelligence. And I would like you to just look at that uh, diagram and tell me within the chat, um, what if emotional intelligence is the sets of skills that helps you know how to engage with people productively based on my earlier discussion, what are some of those things you're seeing among the top skills that relate to emotional intelligence? Let's, let me just give you time to put something on the chat. If you look at this, 10 top skills that are sought after in the marketplace, according to the World Economic Forum. Which of those skills are related to emotional intelligence, given my earlier definition? Let me just see what's coming in the chat. You never know, I might have a gift of oh, Vicky Will. Yes, I might have a gift. Let's see, let's see which words are associated. Yeah, Millicent, I can see that AI is a critical skills for effective leadership. Great, both in the workplace. Empathy, active in listening. Thanks, Manuela. Great. Empathy again. Empathy. 
Mm -hmm. Let's see more coming. Three and eight, resilience. Uh huh. Thanks, Linda. Empathy again. Let's see one more. Motivation and self awareness. Great. Good. So many of us have gotten that right. There's resilience, self awareness, empathy, uh, social influence, and curiosity as well. But now I'm going to introduce you to the genus model that actually lays them out in a neater way, the, the eight skill sets of emotion, the six skill sets of emotional intelligence. And before I do that, um, I had asked earlier that if you go for an interview and you are asked how you have demonstrated uh, emotional intelligence, this is one of those statements you can use that I'm accurately able to perceive, interpret my own and other people's emotions and behaviors in the context of the work environment. For example, and I'll talk to about this towards the end, we all are wired so differently, our personality styles. So there is a way I would want to, to work, but it ends up rubbing somebody else the rough, the rough way. Yet, because I'm their leader, I'm their coach, and I want to drive productivity in the workplace, I have to engage this person in a language they best understand. We are not talking you pamper them like babies, but they, there are some words maybe we may say that just trigger negative emotions because in the end, we are all human beings and there are certain things that trigger us the positive way or the other way. So in an interview, I would say that how I engage my team is I'm able to perceive how my team reacts to certain things I do and I'm able to manage it based on the productivity I want to drive in the workplace. It's also, you can also say it in another way that it's leveraging insights to effectively manage also how you respond and react to certain things. Because if I'm wired in a certain way based on my personality and you tell me something in a certain way, naturally the way we are wired helps us respond differently. Then it rubs the other person the wrong way. Yet as a leader, because I want to drive influence and productivity in the workplace, it ends up bringing acrimony, you know, and people rubbing each other the wrong way. That's why emotional intelligence is also very related to how we can use it to drive workplace and productive cultures. So there is my answer to the first questions, how you can um, tell an interview panel that you demonstrate this skill. In another way, um, I will now share the genus model on how the six competencies of emotional intelligence that also helps you explain how you have demonstrated emotional intelligence in how you engage with people. Now, competency number one is called self-awareness. And the genus model tells us that um, each of these competences has either a productive state, what you can see to the right, or unproductive straight state. So the productive state is what will drive more engagement in the workplace that a leader would want to engage the employees so that you get that performance, that uh, positive workplace culture, removing toxicity in the workplace and end up driving results. So the first competence is self-awareness. So self-awareness basically is just understanding yourself. This is Susan, this is how I, I, I am wired. This is what I love doing. This is what um, my area of limitations. And the model tells us that if your self-awareness, you're aware, you end up being more present in the situation. That is a productive state. If you are not self-aware, you get disconnected to you with your team and with the environment that you're operating in. The second competence is called awareness of others. So it's not just enough to be aware of Susan, and then I'm stuck, I'm like this, I'm results driven and I don't care. No, the people in your team, you need to know about them, your boss, about managing up. You need to know how your boss is wired. That's the awareness of others. And in awareness of others, basically, you are, you are, you are aware about and you perceive and understand and acknowledge others and how also they like to be engaged how they drive results based on their own personality traits or just how they like doing things. 
in so when you demonstrate self-awareness, your productive states end up being you're an empathetic leader. You get more connected with your team. If you're not self-aware, you become an insensitive leader. So insensitivity, according to the model, drives unproductivity in the workplace. And in the previous one, being self-awareness, the present um, uh, leader drives productivity. The disconnected leader, because they are not connected to the even the way how they feel and how their emotions make others feel in the workplace, ends up being a disconnected leader. The third uh, competence, according to the Genos model, which I love very much, and it's one of my personal values, is authenticity. In, in a nutshell, authenticity is just that. You, this is what you see and this is what you get. I don't have any other cards under the table that I'm hiding. You know, what I tell you, I keep my word, I honor my promise, I honor my commitments. I am honest in expressing how I feel also and other things in the workplace. And when you express this uh, competence in the workplace, the model tells us, and it has demonstrated, you end up being a genuine leader. And if you're not, you end up being an untrustworthy leader. And I pause there and to just ask a question. Have you ever dem uh, connected with any colleague in the workplace who has demonstrated this competence, genuineness, and how did it manifest? So that's another question I will ask. You can just put it in the chat. We are halfway through the competency. So I just want to connect with you and hear. Have you ever demonstrated, uh, um, connected with an authentic colleague and an, uh, a very authentic leader? And what are some of those things they did that made you connect with them as a leader that ended up driving productivity? Let me just hear from one or two people. Have you ever connected with an authentic colleague, an authentic leader? And how did that link to how you you drove, drove results in the workplace? Okay, hey, someone who has raised their hand here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I think authenticity uh, boils down to also truth telling. For example, as a leader, I'm personally a leader. So um, that somehow also like shows on my employees. For example, when I, for, let's say, for example, there's a delay in salaries mm -hmm. and then I communicate. It's because of this and that. Then we need to work hard as a team so that there is liquidity, there is money. Normally, um, normally I end up having a more calm workforce mm -hmm. and also they will try to do their best to make sure there's money coming in. And, and I've appreciated this over time uh, because I have stuck with the same team for some, some years now. They are understanding, they know I'm, I'm compassionate and they, they give me back the compassion and right. understanding. So it's really wow. nice to, to, to work that way, thank you. Great. So we can say Joanne is a genuine leader. So when she goes to an interview and she's asked, how have you demonstrated emotional intelligence in the workplace? So one of the things she will say is that I'm a genuine leader. And how I do that is she will just give that example she has shared. So authenticity demonstrates genuineness in the workplace. And if you're not genuine, the opposite is untrustworthiness. And actually, what I've discovered in my engagement uh, um, in, the, in the marketplace is when people feel that you are not trusty, you are not trustworthy, you know, they will also not give you their best because it really has a strong influence on the character of the leader and which ends up driving productivity in the workplace. Great, let's go to the fourth competence. Um, which is uh, emotional reasoning. Now, emotional reasoning is basically using information about yourself, what you know about yourself, and what you know about others to make decisions. So if you are able to do that very well, your productive state ends up being an expansive leader. So you're not just this person who is like, oh, I'm a, this is my personality style, I'm a type A, and you're just stuck in it. But expansiveness now helps you see people from another view, another viewpoint. 
Maybe you like handing out assignments in a certain way, giving clarity, details, step by step. But somebody just tells them, tell me the end game, tell me the finishing line, you know, and allow me to run on my own. And other people may, you may be, I may be wired to work alone in my personality style as an introvert. It doesn't mean I can't work with people, but when you give an extrovert an assignment and maybe they just feel caged working alone, an expansive leader will now use that information to give that colleague team, team based assignment once in a while, you know. So in emotional reasoning, we say that if you are not um, applying this competence, you end up being very limited in the workplace. And I guess you can see from my definition explanation how that limiting comes in because you're just stuck in your own way of doing things. So emotional reasoning, you connect with other people's feelings, how they feel, their, their personality style, and now use that to drive productivity in the workplace. The fifth um, competence is called self-management. And self-management basically is, is about managing your own mood and emotions time and behavior and continu continuously improving yourself. And this is one of those competencies we saw uh, demonstrated during the COVID period, resilience, uh, that you never say die. You remember the energizer battery, you just keep going and going. It doesn't matter whether there are obstacles that, that, that come your way, but you pick yourself up and keep going. But the unproductive state of that is you become temperamental. Why is this happening to me? You know, why me? You know, the why me syndrome, uh, victim syndrome, but the resilience says, okay, it didn't work. I'm going to pick up myself and keep going. So these skills help people to be resilient and manage high work demands and stress rather than being temperamental at work, at the workplace. And the last competence is called inspiring performance. Inspiring performance basically is about positively influencing the way others feel through problem solving, recognizing, and supporting them at work. This is one of the other competence I love because when you demonstrate this, you come across as a very empowering leader to your team. And if you're not, you are very indifferent. So those are the six competencies of emotional intelligence. And um, other thing is uh, about emotional intelligence that I wanted to share as I come to the end is, uh, are you aware of those things that will trigger, you know, their, your worst side, you know, your worst side of things? What would really trigger your worst side of things? Because as human beings, I'm sure there's a, a live wire that I can touch that will make you blow up, you know? So that's the other thing about uh, emotional intelligence. When you are aware of how your emotions uh, impact productivity in the workplace and also the triggers of stress, now this is the reverse. There could be those things that trigger how you react to certain things. You're able to manage them. And I will share with you this um, table, which you can use um, later on to just find out if Susan loves doing things in a, in a certain way, uh, now on the self-awareness side, and also on the awareness of others, you can do it for your colleague. What would be that trigger that would just make things go wrong? You know, for example, if I'm a very, I'm a person who loves working with others, uh, who, who is very driven, let me use that one. And I, you know, I'm results oriented. I want the end game, the A game. And um, you, you're in my team and you go ahead and do a certain thing without consulting me as a boss. You know, I may come across, you know, there's a certain negative thing that will trigger me. So I don't know what that negative trigger would be. So I'll give you a moment to think about it and the default behavior when that thing happens. Because as much as we talk about emotional intelligence driving productivity in the workplace, it's good to see the negative side of things so that you see what would be the alternative behavior to manage that negative emotion and the benefit that it will generate in the workplace. For example, a lack of consultation could trigger a certain 
person in an, another way? Why did you make that decision without consulting me? Why did you go ahead and do it? So the default behavior will be, you know, you feel manipulated. Uh, somebody made a decision and they don't want you to just sign up. And that's not how you like doing things. So I will leave this for you to do it, uh, to use it in another uh, forum as part of just driving your, your, your skill set in emotional intelligence. We can't uh, leave this topic without talking about uh, office politics, you know, and how um, emotional intelligence can also help us manage those politics. So in this one, I just like asking, what are the key actions that will help you navigate, uh, sorry, let me put it in another way. What are some of the key actions that can emo demonstrate emotional intelligence around navigating politics in the working place. And basically around navigating workplace politics, I like explaining it in this way. You proactively, you know that when you do certain things, it triggers certain things, certain things that ends up being uh, uh, political because we all live in a political in environment. So navigating politics is basically proactively navigating the stakeholder environment around you and avoid unwarranted or unproductive reactions and consequences. Unwarranted or unproductive reactions and consequences in the workplace. There's a certain place I shared this and somebody asked me, no, Susan, you know, sometimes um, there are certain places that are so toxic, people just want to drag you in their dark holes all the time. You know, you even get tired and weary about using this emotional intelligence stuff. You know, I'm also a human being, I can blow up, you know, there's something that will trigger. But I, I was just explaining to them and telling them, for example, for me, I know I have to separate, this is about work and this is personal. And this is where I drew the line because we are all employed here, we have come to work here. But I guess this is one of those things, this topic, that can also um, end up being another topic we talk about in the webinar and make it very interactive. Because I know that um, sometimes we can talk so much about emotional intelligence and how it can help you navigate productivity in the workplace and how you engage with your team. But then again, when you're faced with a very uh, political work environment, how do you now manage unwarranted or unre unproductive reactions and consequences? Probably there'll be a question around this. We'll see how, what comes up. Now, what's the end? This is actually the last part, the resilience part. And it doesn't matter what's happening in the environment around you. What I would like to just um, share as my parting shot is within resilience, how will you demonstrate it? When you're faced with obstacles, how do you bounce back? How do you channel emotions to manage job challenges and stress? because this is also leading a lot to um, uh, mental health issues in the workplace. How do you handle disappointment? You know, you were promised this promotion, it never came through, somebody came and cut you. Or rejection without losing effectiveness. Now, I want to use the Clarity for Deal model just around the personality profiles and see how you can build resilience in the workplace. It doesn't matter whether the obstacles come. For example, if you're, um, uh, Clarity 4D has four personality types, uh, but it doesn't box you in one. For example, I can be a red, my second color can be a blue. So the red person line is focused, decisive, direct, challenging, assertive, action-oriented. That's how they thrive. They thrive in that space. So for them, if they are faced in a very tough and work environment, some of the ideas that can help them uh, drive productivity is identify areas they can control, focus on what they can do and take action. Uh, also mark their achievements and celebrate them because these people love success, they love results, they love drive. Think about future opportunities in, instead of getting boxed in the past and what made them fail. Then blue personality type, uh, the blue villagers, as we call them, this is me. You know, we are reflecting, observing, analytical, cautious, formal, very introverted, but it doesn't mean that we can't be extroverted. It's just that this is my preference. So for us, when the resilience comes, some of the ideas we can have is just find a quiet, calm place to rewire, give yourself time before you react, 
list some of the key questions that you need to answer as in plan in a structured way before reacting to certain things. Then the yellow um, resilience, these are people who are really extroverted. They love people, they're cheerful, they're sociable. I, I love the people who come across as yellow because this is usually my weakest color. Uh, so when they come, um, uh, when, when you tell them, uh, let's go to the moon, they are like, oh, let's go now, you know, like now. And and some of us will like, know how are we going, which transport, where is the money, you know, the structured way. But now within resilience, uh, the yellow resilience, when you're faced with that, so such tough uh, uh, workplace issues, you can just verbalize your feelings with people around you. Talk, 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 talk because they love um, engaging with others. Discuss the situation with someone. Treat yourself for something you fancy. Go out, have fun, um, uh, something you love doing. Visualize what you'd like to see because they, they, they operate a lot in, cre in creative spaces. Now, uh, lastly, the green resilience. Um, this is, these people are also very introverted and uh, they concerned, they love working with people. They are supportive, patient, easygoing. And, they can they they thrive when they get that support in the workplace. So find support from a colleague, a workplace. Take time out, go for a walk, allow some time to reflect, but uh, don't dwell too long on the issue. Sense check and sense so do a sense check, the reality of the situation, but also talk to people. Uh, now check also your personality profile and how it aligns to some of the competencies I've talked about so that you can see what works well for you to drive the six competencies in the workplace. And I end my presentation there and open up for a questions and answer session. And Vicky will assist me with that. Uh, feel free to put them on the chat and also to just raise your hand. Vicky? Wow, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so, so much. I'm seeing there's an emoji here. Someone has put a, 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 an interesting sad face. I don't know whether they are worried that it's over <laughs> before it has begun, but some very interesting points there. I think for me, I love that last those last few slides that show us that even resilience is different for each and every single person. The way that I practice or the way that I, the habits that I develop around my resilience is not going to be the same as the habits that uh, Susan develops around her resilience. And I think that is a very important part of uh, understanding just that uh, we are all wired differently. We will all come to the workplace differently. Um, I There was a question here. I don't know, it was at the very beginning. And please, for all the people who are li listening in right now, please put in your questions. Let us know what you think, or even give us your comments. We shall also be reading out the comments that you've, uh, you've written out for us. Um, but there was a question of so someone who had asked, uh, I don't know whether it was a question. The night has disappeared because I could see it. Um, I don't know if you saw it. Where has it gone? About my emotions at work, managing my emotions, the need to understand my own emotions at work when dealing with people at the workplace. The need to understand my own emotions when dealing with people at the workplace. I'm not sure that that was a comment or a question, but uh, maybe you can take it. And then there's another one that has just come in saying, what is the relationship between emotional intelligence and mental health? That is a second question that has come through directly to me. What is the relationship between um, emotional intelligence and mental health? Okay. Let me pick the, the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we define emotional intelligence as a set of skills that helps you perceive, understand, express and reason and manage emotions within yourself and others. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things I'm just thinking on top of my head is if I'm not able to manage these emotions within myself and others, especially I would say maybe you, I have very high expectations about myself and things don't go the right way. So if I'm not able to be self-aware that I'm my, my buy is there, but I have it below, you know, I will always feel disappointed, you know, and how far mm -hmm. will I go with that disappointment? I'm not a psychologist, but I'm just thinking. I would just get to a point where I say, okay, I didn't hit the bar, but that's not the end of the game. 
you know, for example, if I'm the red personality type and it's results, 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 but then the results are not coming. You know, how will I now be able to just tell myself, uh, change the way you're working or change this job is not working for me to see. Now on the reverse side is how other people also treat you or behave around you. You're not able to manage uh, your own, the other's emotions and how you react to them. So that could, I also feel could trigger a lot of pressure, a lot of um, maybe even a feelings of self unworthiness, you know, you're just feeling mm -hmm. you can't match up, you can't meet up, uh, you're below the bar, you know, just feeling down all the time, which is really bad. But it's because you don't know this is my limit and their limit is there and you can't, you will need time to get there. It doesn't mean that you can't get. Yeah. So that pressure, I think, can put a lot of psychological uh, pressure, which can lead to mental health issues. But I would love to hear from my psychologist uh, also to just understand how now the brain is wired yes. medically and how it works, yeah. Okay, there's another question here from Christina Chang. She says, thanks, Dr. Susan. Being authentic is not easy, especially when giving feedback to colleagues, evaluations, ETC. How do you build this skill continuously? Mm -hmm. Wow. I think one of the things, and I think Vicky, we always do this with the five behaviors of effective teams. And the top one behavior of a dysfunctional team is lack of trust. You know, lack of trust where somebody, for example, if Vicky is not performing in a certain way, I can just go and tell her in a way that she will know I'm not attacking her personality. I'm not putting her down. She trusts my comments. She trusts my feedback that I want her to be a better person to move to the next level. So when you move, you do it from a point of trust and um, also the, the aspect in employee personal, personal development, um, we talk about that. I mean, not everybody is, is a gone case. Everybody has room for improvement. So if you Put it from you, you, you are, I would approach it from a positive perspective and also the aspect of building trust. That if I give you a negative feedback, I'm not attacking your character, I'm not attacking your personality, I'm not putting you in a in jail like you will never improve, you will never come out of prison. I mean, you, 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 when you do it in that way, I think, uh, and connect from a trust perspective, it can work. But you see, trust can't also be built around uh, just workplace assignments. You know, are there team building opportunities to understand people? Uh, who, who is Susan? You know, be, be outside of work. What does she love doing? What does she uh, love not doing? So I think from my perspective, that's how I would approach it. From a trust perspective, you tr use trust and then uh, use use trust to also build authenticity and let the other person know that you're doing it not from a point of a criticism, but a point of where you want them to move to the next level. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there are any other further questions, uh, please do let us know. Um, I want to ask Marvin to share his slides so that um, we can talk about what's next. I can see um, there's a question here from Nancy Wawero. She says, thanks, Dr. Susan and Vicky. How well do you reconcile between emotional intelligence and disciplinary measures at work? Wow, very interesting question. <laughs> I'm telling you, hey, Charles, we go through a lot of stuff. Huh? Uh, so mm -hmm. you want to, but, but what I would want to say is that, um, uh, you see, sometimes, um, we we may struggle enforcing certain certain things that would um, look like we are being mean, we are being bad, etc. But that is workplace policy. If somebody has breached an issue and the policy is clear on the disciplinary measures, now the emotional intelligence will come in. Is in at the end of the game, this person is a human being. You know, they may have done it but now the repercussions are so serious. 
but uh, the consequences and, and the consequences. So you have to see how to maybe more communicate the issue more empathetically, you know, connecting with them. It doesn't remove the punishment, but it's not like now telling somebody now go live now, etc. Just following the due process with empathy as a competence um, and how you demonstrate it in connecting with the other person, connecting with their sorriness, but their sorriness doesn't mean that they will not go through the disciplinary process because this is an organization. It is run by policies and procedures and we must all be compliant. So that I'm not being, uh, I'm not favoring an individual, yet um, we are, a thousand people in this institution and we all have to, to go by the rules. So how I would look at it is, um, it's maybe how you communicate more with empathy and uh, the sorry doesn't mean that um, when the other person is sorry, it doesn't mean that um, the repercussions for their disciplinary issue will, will go under the table. They have to go through the due process. That's how I would react. Okay, okay, thank you. I'd also like to say that sometimes there is a, a like a a connotation that uh, when we have when we are high in EI, we don't call out uh, bad behavior. Like we are more lenient with someone who's high in EI. When actually the opposite is uh, is true. The more you grow in emotional intelligence, the more you want to have those authentic conversations because the more you don't want conflict to to fester and to boil underneath the surface because it doesn't let anyone. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not good for anyone. So even disciplinary measures at work, it's a skill as uh, Dr. Susan was putting it. And the higher you go in emotional intelligence, the better you are at actually addressing those issues with a lot of empathy and finesse. But it, I, I do not believe that the more you are emotionally intelligent, the more that uh, you will sometimes let things slide. There's one last question over here, um, again, about toxicity. And how does toxicity drive a change? How can one use EI to drive a change in that culture, in leadership? Mm. Wow, that's that's very interesting. Uh, because um, sometimes, um, the, the other day I was also just training somewhere on uh, emotional intelligence and just somebody told me that, um, yeah, those, those are good skills to have, but sometimes you can face People who are just bent and bound to destroy you, you know, to finish you, to finish you. How do you now uh, design that this person is out to destroy me and uh, manage that issue? But the way we deal with toxicity in the workplace, especially, is around organizational culture, and we always share around. Um, actually, I think there is one slide we had. The one Vicky we have about. Uh, molding a culture, how emotional intelligence can mold a workplace culture. Because basically you want to drive positive behaviors, positive behaviors that, for example, if we say teamwork is one of our values, you know, how do you uh, make people demonstrate it on an everyday basis so that it's not just a value on the wall? For example, uh, one of the things is uh, around teamwork is I reach out to my colleagues, you know, I just don't focus on my, my, my finished work and I say, wow, I can live all Mali. How do I reach out to my colleagues? How do I support them? So the toxicity would be, would also be demonstrated by negative behaviors where maybe one person is always left in the office, you know, the last person to leave the office all the days. Friday, Saturday, they are working, Sunday, they are working, and nobody is reaching out to them to find out um, what is it, what are they struggling? Is it lack of skills? So certain things, if it is one of your values is trust, how is the negative, the, the negative side of trust manifested? Maybe somebody lied, you know, somebody uh, stole something in the workplace, you know, small, small things, behaviors, but what I would want to, let me put it in another way. Look at your corporate values and ask yourself, how are those values demonstrated on an everyday basis? If it is responsibility, what is responsibility? So the negative side of that 
would be now what drives toxicity and a toxic work culture. So that's, that's how I would put it in your context. So just pick one of your values. If it is trust, if it is responsibility, if it is integrity. So the negative or the reverse side is now what drives a toxic workplace culture. So as a leader is to be aware of those things that would drive a negative workplace culture, the reverse side, the negative behaviors, so that you manage them proactively. By just celebrating the ones who are doing the good behaviors, that could be one of them. What are those things as leaders we do every day in the workplace to promote the positive workplace behaviors that end up now being a positive workplace culture rather than a negative workplace culture? That's how I would respond to that. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, uh, uh, today I was with a team and we were saying um, the emotion is the one that drives the behavior, as, as Dr. Susan was saying. And we were talking about the way um, a, 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 a place that is full of fear, um, the behavior you will see is blame, blame game. You know, no one wants to take responsibility yes, exactly. for, for anything that is going wrong. It is so and so, it is so and so. And we're exploring it further and saying that instead of addressing the emotion that is that is that is being perpetuated, which is fear, you find that as a leader, you you, you stand up in a in very aggressively saying, "Why is no one taking up ownership for the wrong things that are happening?" You're just addressing the behavior, but the very tone of how you speak, the very tone of how you say those words, perpetuates the fear that is actually the emotion that everyone is feeling, and so they're not going to own up. So. Again, just to give further insight into what Dr. Susan was saying. So um, I think we are about that time. We have about seven more minutes to this webinar. If you have any other questions, you can you can um, put them on the chat. I'm going to ask Marvin to just share his screen for a short while uh, because we want to let you know um, the other events that uh, we are hosting uh, um, coming soon. And uh, if you are still interested in, um, in listening on to these webinars, just uh, be part of the newsletter because we run this on a monthly basis and we speak about issues like this and other issues affecting the workplace. Um, as generous practitioners, I think you had, um, Susan mentioned that she's a generous emotional intelligence practitioner, so am I, and we have a few other associates. We do certify for training and facilitation in emotional intelligence. We also certify um, human resource professionals or even just uh, business leaders in this thing called emotional intelligence to help them be able to understand and to get tools that they can use to be able to drive the positive culture that we're talking about, to be able to get um, 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 processes and frameworks that reward for the kind of behavior that, we, that we're talking about. So it's a very useful certification, whether you are a human resource professional, a business leader, but more importantly, if you're a facilitator or a coach in this um, particular area of uh, human resource, talent management and development, um, the second thing is that it is starting on the 16th of July. If you are interested, there are some details being shared uh, by Marvin on the on the chat right now. That is our email address and where how you can get us. Um, the second thing is that we are hosting a symposium at uh, in um, Mombasa, um, and um, this is going to happen from the 22nd to the 24th of August. Um, this is just a save the date poster. Um, and it is going to really delve more into emotional intelligence, the different realms of emotional intelligence. We're going to be speaking about it from um, from a, production, a productivity point of view, from a culture point of view. We're going to have master classes that also talk about it, even from a spiritual point of view. And we're going to have a few experts around the room that link emotional intelligence to the various mm -hmm. things that we encounter in our in our day to day mm -hmm. life. Um, other than that, um, I don't know if you have any last uh, parting remarks before we close uh, this session. Uh, Marvin, please put the email addresses on the chat. Dr. Susan, any last remarks? Um, thank you everyone for the comments. And uh, let us also know what else you'd like to to hear about. I think, Vicky, one of the other topics we need to just uh, talk about more around EI is the issue of managing workplace politics. <laughs> um, yes. 
yeah, it always keeps evolving different dynamics. So I would just invite everyone to share any other topics that they want us to talk about. Okay, so if there are any other topics you'd like us to talk about, please um, write to us. I've written our email address uh, over there. Um, it is info at uh, profiles.co.ke. Our number is very simple. It is 0722, I'm writing it, um, 457777. 0722457777. And for those in Tanzania, you can reach out to um, it, the Impact Leadership Academy, and the number is... Uh, Zero seven seven four two three zero one one one, and you can reach them on email um rukaya dot abbas at impact leadership academy dot co dot tz or diana dot makombe at impact leadership academy dot co dot tz. So please um using those email addresses and using the form that you've been given to over there that you can click and uh, it will be able to take you to some registration, let us know what other topics you'd like us to cover. And uh, without um, any further ado, thanking you as always for being part of this, allow me to wish you a, a good evening and to really thank you, Dr. Susan Burake, for being with us this evening, for talking a little bit about emotional intelligence, um, what it, its relationship is to the workplace productivity, and generally also talking about um, the questions that have been asked around of them. City, um, holding people accountable. I'm sure they have, in one way or another, um, and, um, been of some use or some insight to the people who have listened. So to everyone, Asante Sana. We hope to see you in the next webinar. And God bless you. Be well, keep well, and have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.